<laughs> Has that done it? Has that done it? Hold on, we go and... Yeah, it says it's now streaming live. <laughs> You're right. Ah, I blame Glenn. All right, we're off. I, I messed up everything. <laughs> oh man, here we are. We're live. There we go. We are hey. live now. We are, oh, we can even say that in the chat. All right. Um, I blame Glenn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, hello, welcome to Critical Witness, where we are still figuring out how to use basic technology. Uh, <laughs> my name's Phil. Uh, Dan and I are mates that go back to university. We started this channel um, because we talk theology and we're geeks. Um, and uh, we thought we'd invite Len along to join in the conversation. We have a few topics to potentially discuss. We might talk about them. We might just go all around the houses. You're welcome to ask us questions on the live chat and we may or may not ignore you. Um, but we are very glad that you're watching and We've got more viewers than subscribers at the moment, which is really exciting. Come on. <laughs> Click that bell, people. Click that bell. <laughs> it's all for you, Glenn. It's all for you. So a little bit of background for me, because although I introduced myself already, um, it didn't go live. So I'm, I'm Phil. I work with a local charity in Guildford. Well, it's a national charity called Friends International, but I'm in the local Guildford branch, uh, welcoming international students to the UK, um, basically cross-cultural ministry stuff, but also just making people feel welcome and connect them to the, our, our town. And I also help lead a local church. Dan, what do you do? Uh, yeah, so I'm a registered healthcare professional and uh, academic at uh, London University and to topics related to bioethics, like uh, abortion, artificial womb technology and conscientious of, uh, of objection and a Christian. Hey, there you go. Yeah, I didn't say that. I, I am a Christian as well. <laughs> You hope so as a pastor. I, I mean, I, well, you never know these days. We uh, could be progressive. Mm -hmm. um, so, Glenn, welcome to the, I think we're the, this is the third live stream of Critical Witness. Uh, we're true professionals. Mm -hmm. And um, just tell us a little bit about yourself, who, how you became a Christian and what you do now. And then we'll see where this conversation takes us. Okay, I'm Glenn, and I'm married to Emma. We've got Ruby and JJ as our kids, and I'm a Christian, and um, that became very real for me, I guess, when I was about 21 years old, end of university, unemployed, time on my hands, picked up the Bible and met Jesus in a really powerful way, and I've been telling people about him ever since. I'm ordained in the Church of England, but my day job is to work for a charity called Speak Life, and uh, that frees me up to go around the place and shoot my mouth off about Jesus, uh, but also to um, perhaps communicate in other ways, whether through books or videos, podcasts, courses, tracts, that sort of thing. Oh, you even do tracts. That's, that's I, 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 do you know anyone else who's come up with a pyramidal tract, a threefold tract for a threefold God? Have you ever, have you ever heard of such a thing? It's, it's the Mercedes-Benz of tracts. <laughs> it sounds and, like it. Um, 10 of those have had to discontinue them because they're just so expensive. It's like literally oh, really? a pound. It's a pound per tract because they've got oh. to be folded in just the right way. But yeah, the gospel's it's... worth it. Tra <laughs> totally. Tracks are so hard to make. I, I've, I think mm. me and you, Phil, have tried to make tracks before. Mm -hmm. It's so yeah. difficult because you're like, you end up with like, you think, right, I'm going to do like a really short one. And then it ends up being two A4 sides. And then, and then mm. we've got all these, all our sort of, darlings that we love and we don't want to kill them we're like oh, no, that one's got to stay in there oh, yeah. I can't do that. you know well uh, it's, it's really it's difficult. a good technique though it's a good well it's, it's a good mm. discipline you know mm. can you um not because you have a reductionistic view of the gospel and you think it you know you need to get it out in an elevator pitch because people are going to hell and you must you know um but for your own sake in terms of clarity for your own thinking what is most essential to what you want to communicate it's a, it's a good exercise can i go and show it show you it yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. go for it go for it that would be one good second. yeah yeah it is um it tracks it's, it's difficult making a track that i remember making it. that track i've got it somewhere on my computer i think it's backed up in one drive somewhere <laughs> we, can actually, we could actually look at <laughs> so you're, you're showing up your track i was just telling dan that i could probably find um what we tried back in the day uh a... see i'm putting hey, it under my that... chin i'm so see like you, know, you start you start off with life according to jesus and That's then you flip D1. it over yeah. and it's god is a loving union of three and you read about the three and then the world is shaped by two representatives, Adam and Christ, and you fold that down. And then you're born one with Adam, be one with Jesus. You fold that down, right? And then 
it becomes the pyramid. You put that on the table and you, and you sort of talk about, oh, can we talk about God's threeness and can we talk about the world's two-ness and your oneness, right? That's Boom. top level stuff, Glenn. No, it's Boom. top level. No, top yeah, level. but it's, it's all been um, decommissioned <laughs> by ten of those. So how many of them it's have you got left sitting around? <laughs> I've got like 12. Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> not, not very many. Is, is there, do you think there's much use for tracks? I remember when I first became a Christian, the church I was part of, like my granddad as well, we, we go out um, you know, every Saturday to the local town, like into town stains giving out tracks and and um you know for sort of a morning or afternoon do you think there's still does that still work like is it are they yeah, waste I think, of time I think, or? I think oh no I, I i definitely do that i i think the main thing i want to get into people's hands is like john's gospel or i i have a big stash of gospels and i and i usually right. try and get those into people's hands um and you know with the caveat that most tracts are terrible um you know, I I went through Eastbourne the other day, and uh, that's where I live, Eastbourne on the south coast of England. And um, and bless them, the, the, there was a group with um a table out, and the, their prominent tract that they were um pushing on people is um this this flames on the on the front cover, and it says God's wrath is as eternal as God's love. They weren't and, Jack Chick ones, were they? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I'm sure it's from the same publisher, but um, yeah, God's wrath is as eternal as God's love. And and you know, I got into a good conversation with the guy. I was kind of like, is that true? In eternity past, you know, was that was the father loving the son on Monday and then hating the son on Tuesday, <laughs> and then back to loving him on Wednesday? And then... it's all together, Glenn. They're not they're not separate. They're, his wrath is a part of his love, isn't it? Right. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so Towards he, the son, like constantly. Yeah. Is he, is he constantly angry at the sun as well? And we don't, don't let logic get in the way of your tracks. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know someone who wrote a, a dissertation defending the statement, God is hate. Mm. Um, yeah, because, okay, because, you know, wrath is an aspect of God's love and the simplicity of God means that God is hate. And he's just like, oh, I, mm. you know, mm, please, yeah. <laughs> please no. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, mm. some, tracks, some tracks are better than others. Sorry, at least he acknowledged it needed defending. Which, which, oh, the, the what, the wrath of God so, needed defending? Yeah, yeah. Hate, yeah. But I, I, th I think what people try to do is they try to reverse engineer their gospel from the end. And then you kind of, and so if the, if the main deal is there's heaven or hell, you just reverse engineer everything, even back into the eternal being of God. Mm -hmm. And you put people in the hot seat and you, and you tell them go left or go right, which is kind of like, you know, it's um, Hercules at the crossroads, isn't it? You know, Hercules on his great adventures. One of the adventures is, do you go the way of wisdom or do you go the way of folly? And, you know, the way of folly is represented by this woman who's very seductive and not very, you know, well-dressed. Um, and obviously she looks attractive, but watch out because at the end, you know, it, it leads to destruction. On the other side, there's the woman dressed as wisdom and she looks very prim and proper. Um, but you know that it's probably the wise thing to do. And what a hero, what a hero Hercules is. He goes the way of wisdom and not the way of folly, um, you know. So isn't, isn't he great? And isn't that so much of evangelism? So much of evangelism is people, you know, saying there's heaven or hell. And if you're clever, I, I know it doesn't look like much fun. <laughs> I, I know she looks a lot more attractive, but come on, be clever. Think about this. And then you are Hercules walking the way of wisdom. That's so much evangelism. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and that's how I do it. And we're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, All this time. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's whereas I think evangelism is is Lazarus in the tomb, not Hercules at the crossroads. It's you know saying live to sinners. Yeah. Amen. So, so how, how, yeah, oh, go on. You that, go, Phil. No, no, you take it away, mate. No, I was gonna say. How, so, how long have you been doing evangelism for? Like, have you been an evangelist for? How long have I been an evangelist? So since 2010, I was um, I was a curate in the Church of England, which is a vicar with your L plates on. And then instead of being a grown up and getting my own church, um, I landed on my feet, got this job it's in the same town where I was already curate and didn't have to change church. So I, I still preach regularly at my home church, part of a home group and all that sort of stuff. But that's that's kind of in, in my spare time and my my. Um, yeah, my day-to-day -day job for the last 10 years has been as an evangelist, which, you know, I, I take to be um, not only world-facing, proclaiming Christ, but also church-facing, equipping the saints for their works of service as, as Ephesians 4, um, yeah, as, as Ephesians 4 describes the work of an, of an evangelist to equip God's people for their works of evangelistic service. 
Did that was that something you always kind of felt that their God was kind of leading you, like that was sort of in- inevitable, or was it something that sort of changed? Yeah, looking back, it's obvious, and it was obvious to a lot more people than it was to me. You know, when the job came up, and I said, "Oh, Emma, there's, there's this job going, and it's for an evangelist." But am I an evangelist? And she was almost physically violent with me. She was like, "How can you have that little self knowledge? How can how can you not know yourself? Of course you're like." Like she was like, "You know, when we go on holiday, you you actually set aside time to go in, on mission, and and you plan missions and you lead missions that weren't there before. And what are all the books that you ever read? And if you have an, an aspect of ministry, in what direction do you always try to turn it?" And, and eventually, this is why the whole idea of gifting and, and the whole idea of like discover your spiritual gifts, I don't think it should be a navel gazing exercise in which I, you know, fill out a questionnaire and think about, you know, the complicated splendor that is me. Um, I think, you know, you should just ask your church leaders, you should ask your friends, you should ask your wife, and they'll have a much better idea of, of how you're wired, how you're gifted. But I've always been an advocate and an enthusiast with whatever. And as soon as I became a Christian, I was, I was, yeah, rabbiting on about Jesus. So looking back, yes, I've always been an evangelist, but owning, owning that title took me a long time. Interesting. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Go on, go on, you go, Phil. Otherwise, <laughs> we're still working out how this works. I mean, that, Dan just can take it away. I'm quite happy uh, listening. But with, with that title, evangelist, is, was was it just something you didn't quite grasp the meaning of? Uh, what an evangelist is is it and there's, mm. there's certain ideas and christian mm. culture that goes alongside the word evangelist oh yeah do you do you feel comfortable owning that title is that something that you would choose to call yourself yeah only because i have the temperament of an evangelist and i don't care what people think <laughs> <laughs> but if i did care what people yeah. think i would run a mile from the title because I, you know, one of the first things I do in evangelism training when I'm teaching Christians about everyday witness, I say, describe to me an evangelist. And they end up describing the most like hideous alpha male with the gift of the gab. And they go door to door selling you, you know, insurance, but they happen to be selling Jesus. You know, mm-hmm. that kind of, that's really unpleasant person who you would never want to get to know. You'd certainly never want them as your friend. And they, so they describe this person which is a total caricature. And then I I split them up in pairs and I say, now talk to your neighbor about um, someone who was really helpful in you trusting Jesus. And then they feed back from that. And I say, now describe that person. And that person is warm and has integrity and had all the time in the world for them. And, you know, they they end up describing someone incredibly different. So there's a real Mm -hmm. PR problem. I I think we need to employ some evangelists for the, for the topic of, you know, for the, for the, for the name evangelist, because, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we think, we think of them as these reptilian figures with fire in their bellies, you know, thumping their Bibles. But when you look back at who is it, who has helped me trust in Jesus? Yeah. There's, there've been some preachers along the way, but you know, my mum praying for two decades and a whole bunch of other people, you know, the, the daggiest guy at university, you know, I'm I'm from Australia. So I I use, you know, phrases like daggy, but the the least cool person. I I grew up around Australians, but Mm. that's, that's, that's even foreign to me. What's that? What do you mean by daggy? daggy. Um, naff. Would that be a, an English yeah. kind of equivalent? Yeah. Um, if you ask a shepherd what a dag is, a dag is actually um, the bit of fly bone blown poo at the end of, of a um, sheep's tail that you need to um, <laughs> cut off. <laughs> but a dag is just like a bit of a nerd. He's a bit naff. He's a bit, you know. And there was, a, there was a guy at university who was always inviting me to church and he was the least cool guy. And eventually I did go and just I just hated the preacher every Sunday and then went back to hate the preacher some more and hate the preacher some more and hate the preacher more, some more. And, and it, eventually it, it sort of worked on me and I, and I became a Christian. But um, hmm. yeah. So uh, evangelism is... Uh, partly being persistent, I suppose. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just keep keep going for it. Being a good friend, being persistent, and and being the sort of person you turn to when life gets difficult. Because I I I still think that where people go in their minds when they hear an evangelist is they they do think of the the guy who can crack a thousand and one mother in law gags. Um, but actually, people are not ready really to do business with God until they get serious about life. Yeah. And, you know, when you get the diagnosis 
or your partner leaves you or, you know, you, you're made redundant or you have the third miscarriage or, you know, and, and at that moment, people are ready to, you know, to go for a beer or go for a drink and ask, you know, what's the, what's the meaning of life? But you don't go <laughs> to the, the motor mouth with a thousand and one mo mother-in-law gags at that stage. You, you go to someone who showed a bit of integrity and quiet, gentle friendliness and love and, you know, so be be the person your friend will trust when life gets hard. Don't don't be the person who always have a thousand has a thousand answers to you know philosophical questions. That's yeah, that's a lot of what I say when I when I do training. That's good. What um what would what would you say about what's the relationship between evangelism and apologetics? Um, I'd be interested in your on your on your take on that whether the two uh, should be separated you know should we have a apologists who aren't evangelists and evangelists who aren't apologists what do you think about that it so depends it's it's one of those one of those debates where definitions are everything and see i could you know i could rail against apologetics um and and rant and rave um because i'm thinking about it in one sense and I can own apologetics and love it and um, commend it to people, depending on what I mean by apologetics. And if by apologetics we mean thoughtful, contextualized evangelism that is not afraid of questions but meets people in the questions that they ask and wants to give them relevant, thoughtful, biblical answers, then I'm 1,000% for apologetics and who could possibly be against it? If by apologetics we mean engaging an unbeliever on neutral space and uh, from first principles, reasoning towards God, reasoning towards heaven, reasoning towards spiritual truth, then I see it as a kind of um, Pelagianism. You know, the, you know the, the old Pelagian heresy was that in the realm of salvation, um, you kick things off with a whole bunch of works and then God might meet you halfway with a bit of grace and that gets you over the line. Um, I think translated into the sphere of knowing God, you can have a kind of Pelagianism that's like um, reason, 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 and then God tops you up with a bit of rev revelation and then you know God. Mm -hmm. If that's what people mean by apologetics, then I'm against it. If what people mean by apologetics is thoughtful, contextualized evangelism that takes people's questions seriously and answers them with the gospel, then I'm for it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, go on, Phil. You, 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 no, you no, 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 you, you go for it. Uh, you, you want to follow up? There's, there's a, no, it's, go on. I my question will probably end up taking us down another rabbit trail, but I wanted to know what you were about to say. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I often find that uh, the... A lot, of, a lot of apologetics is often aimed at people inside the church rather than outside of it. And um, I probably wouldn't explain it in the way you did. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, my, my understanding is that sort of if, you, if you're going to be an evangelist nowadays, it's, you have to, you have to your, your evangelism has to be apologetic in a sense. Like, you know, you have to have considered the... Um, you know the questions and concerns that that, that people have, um, and and have thought, of, you know, of take take them seriously yourself. But it often seems that a lot of the poly, apologetic books and and things going on tend to be more tailored towards the uh, the church rather than um, uh, rather than those, those outside. Mm. Um, mm. But I yeah. I agree, and and you know, and to a degree. Um, it is for the building up of the church to, to a degree, you know, seeing that Jesus answers the questions that people have um, edifies the saints. Um, that's true, but um, there is a heck of a lot of shadow boxing going on um, in apologetics. And, and I, I mean, I notice a lot more, there's a lot more shadow boxing going on in the States than there is here mm -hmm. because in the States you can actually build up an apologetics ministry and, you don't really very often have to actually engage non-Christians. <laughs> no. um, you're, you're always, you're always playing to your base. Yeah. And, and or, defend, it, or defending from your base. <laughs> defending from your base. You know, your, your apologetics is also in, internalized. You, you, right. 
end up with one slight air on doctrine or mainly evolution versus mm-hmm. order, and suddenly you're you're defending yourself both from atheists and and christians alike um, yeah yeah when you're set up like that yeah i mean I, d- I did a debate with matt dillahunty at the start of the year and i wanted then... to talk to you about that so i'm glad you brought it up okay well i loved it um, <laughs> um well, there were, I, there were, I, there were a few it, people who didn't. I, I, I love what yeah, you read the, I read the comments. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't read the YouTube comments. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Don't read the YouTube comments. But also, don't watch the Christian review videos either. So mm-hmm. there, 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 are a number of, um, there are a number of review videos in the States, one of them by a very prominent apologist who, you know, didn't know me from Adam. And, 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 and you know, he, he kind of, jumped in halfway and kind of said this is the problem um when you're not a reformed apologist and and, and things like that and i was like how does he know i'm not reformed how, like like i mm. <laughs> i i am an anglican from <laughs> how dare, how dare you? <laughs> I, yes, I am from oak hill theological college my goodness i am a hebrew of hebrews <laughs> according so yeah so and and what what really struck me was that there is an entire ecosystem in the States that rewards apologists, not for actually engaging with non-Christians, but for actually defending their tribe and their tribe's way Mm -hmm. of doing apologetics Mm -hmm. to the point where you just, you just take out, you take down another brother or a sister because they didn't, they didn't quite do it the way that you do it. Mm. And, you know, you spend your entire time in a, in a country that, you know, 40%, go to church and it's incredibly it's an incredibly christian populace Mm. um and actually actually i think i've got a lot of time and respect for someone like a tim keller Mm. who recognizes that he needs to look over the atlantic to england and europe because they are in a post-christian moment that is coming for the states and his his impetus is is his impulse is to look at you know the uk and say what can i learn from evangelists and preachers in 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 the uk because i need to learn from them and bring it to the us but then there's an attitude from a a few other uh evangelists and apologists that that is a little bit different and there's just a nasty ecosystem that rewards shadow boxing Mm. rather than actually engaging with Mm non-christians yeah and and that and that and that's sort of one of my concerns i'd like to see really I was had in my head um, sort of the US example, like say people have I mean, whole apologetics ministries that rarely, if ever, seem to be engaging with with non-Christians. And there, there's definitely a, a, a role for like, because I think part of apologetics is, like you said, is equipping believers to sort of have the confidence to, um, to go out and do evangelism. But apologetics just sort of sitting home, reading books, you know, honing the ontological argument and, and, the, <laughs> and the, um, you know, the moral argument and the kalam, et cetera. I, I, you know, it has very little um, benefit unless it's, you know, and, yeah. unless, unless it's used in the sort of evangel- evangelistic sort of co- context. Yeah. Um, and but I think there's something about apologetics that, that draws especially men in, young yeah. guys mm-hmm. and men in. Yeah. Because it, it's sort of a, you know, you know, we we developed to, you know, you know well, actually, I'm not going to get into anthropo- you know, evolution things like that, but anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, but um, you know, we we developed to sort of fight, and we, we can't physically fight, and so we we intellectually fight, and it ends up becoming sort of intellectual <laughs> yeah. jousting, you know, yeah. um, like the example you gave for the critique of your video, it's it's mm-hmm. it, it, it's. Um, and mm. that, that's that kind of stuff frustrates me but i think mm. the stuff you do is great because you know people like yourself i think another UK, a good example in the uk would be someone well he's moved to australia now but david robertson was quite mm-hmm. good at that in the sense he's, mm. he was a pastor who who valued apologetics and the questions that that skeptics and, and, and non-christians actually had and and utilized it in its best in in mm. in, in, in evangelistic context mm. Um, mm. I do, I do worry about like you have these enclaves of apologetics, but it stays, it stays in that enclave and never. Actually and could it, and could it do more harm than good in that it communicates to people that you have to be um, a, a real bookworm 
like mm. those, you know, th that, that tiny fraction of, of men. And again, you know, we're caricaturing an evangelist. Whenever I say, what does an evangelist look like? It's always yeah. male, which is incredible. Cause then I asked, you know, who's led you to the Lord and, and it's at least 50% female. Yeah. Um, and with apologists, if, if our mm. picture of, of someone who's able to engage with non-Christians mm. is um, a, a mega brain, who knows the answers to stuff um that's just incredibly unhelpful and and yeah i mean most of the time when i'm asked questions i i don't know the answer to if, it, if it's in a conversational thing um the best answer is i don't know mm -hmm. that's a really good question mm -hmm. and and as soon as you say i don't know you're communicating to them loads you're communicating to them that actually in spite of whatever this objection might be jesus is more compelling mm -hmm. Um, I'm not, I'm not rattled by this, you know? Yeah. That's why I like, um, Tim, Tim Keller's sermons. Like I, um, mm. I try not, I mean, I, we're not allowed idols as close as I get is Tim Keller. Like yeah. that's, that's yeah. as close as I get. But you're a saint. Yeah. <laughs> but he's, <laughs> but I, 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 I love, I love his sermons because every sermon that I've listened to, it seems to be exactly the same is here is a problem. Here is the secular response. Here is why it's, it's not satisfying. Jesus is better. Mm. Right. That's that's every sermon. Yeah, he does, it's he law win. and gospel. Yeah, yeah. it's mm. law and it's it's good old fashioned law and gospel. Mm. Um, We've got he, something on the um, chat comments just to sort of compliment before we move on. Uh, Athy Sinclair says, uh, "Could they going to? I think we believe this is talking about the apologists still potentially the American ones. Uh, could they do with reading Galatians again? Would they be better off putting their own house in order and then going back to what the Bible says before they try telling others of the gospel?" I think that's a, a fairly pointed uh, look. And I've, I've noticed that in the, the sort of apologetics ministries, oftentimes it's about the kalam, it's about the moral, it's about the ontological. And I'm finding in, in the ministry with people on, here is the encouragement just to read your Bible with them, be a friend with mm -hmm. them. And what you're saying about the evangelist of, who, who's known to be the one that uh, has integrity says i don't know when i don't mm. when i don't it doesn't speak into things that they know nothing about which we might go on to in a bit but the it is the this is important to me i want to share it with you let's read it together it's the best form of evangelism that we can have but when we set up these apologist apologetic uh ministries as such it's it is the danger that they're the they're on the pedestal they know all the stuff instead of me talking to you about the Bible, here's a link uh, to this other guy who knows all the stuff. And I, I've, I see that a little bit in the UK, um, especially with the sort of, and this is kind of what I've seen in the university culture, particularly is the CU events weeks, which you have been part party to is. And, and I think it's starting to shift a little bit in training the CUs up to be able to share with their friends but it's still that element of I've got this evangelist here who knows his stuff. Let me bring you to him and he can give you the answers. And then when they leave the CEO events, because I don't know the answers that guy did. <laughs> mm. <laughs> We're not going to talk about it anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, and is that what yeah. a, is that what a, an events week is about answering thorny questions? <sighs> It it's, 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 it's fallen into that, you know, that whole thing. And, and, you know, the lunchtime talks are meant to be all about, you know, engaging the questions that unbelievers have, but it, it seems to be engaging the questions that a whole bunch of angry atheists might have, mm. which is a min certainly a minority mm -hmm. of the student population. And, you know, and so you, you fly the entire campus and saying things like, does God hate gays? <laughs> come and find out at lunchtime we'll give you pizza <laughs> yeah, we'll give you and you're food. like they would come just for the pizza, pizza. Yeah. Come on, you didn't pizza. need to put <laughs> into their heads the does god hate gay people thing you know <laughs> it's like there's a there's a pastor in um uh in australia called dominic Steele, and he's 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 got a whole rant uh, around this you know churches that put on these apologetic evenings where they you know say does god hate gay people does god hate women you know he's got mm -hmm. a gen genocidal maniac come and find out sunday night um he's like you know would coca-cola ever advertise you know their cola by saying does coke rot your teeth <laughs> to our meeting find out <laughs> um yeah and you've, you've just put the thought into the heads of like 
you know, 98% of the people aren't going to come to your event. You've put the thought into the heads of 100% of the, of the student population. And you've put the evangelist like me on the back foot instantly. Mm-hmm. I, went, I went up to Sheffield University and, and did um, one of these weeks. This is, this is years ago. And so, you know, every, everyone's graduated now. And I, I, can, uh, I can divulge uh, <laughs> the, the, the place. But, you know, the, 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 week, the lunchtime talks were all things like, does God hate gays and things? And, and, then, and then there was one like, does God hate women? And, and they, thankfully, they thought, well, let's, let's have a woman like speak there. And so they had this woman come. She spoke brilliantly, wisely, warmly. And then Q&A came. And the, the questions were just so fiery because the, the head of the Secular Humanist Association got up and just, just pelted her with every question on topic, off topic. You know, what about homophobia? What about Old Testament wars? What about hell? What about this? What? And she answered so wisely, so warmly, so graciously. But everyone's shoulders were up around here because it was just adversarial in the whole way that it was set up. And then some poor, poor student has to get up and say, okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, please do come back tonight. Um, anyway, enjoy the pizza. And I just turned to the guy who I was with and I said, what did, what did you make of all this? And he thought for a second and he pointed to the atheist guy and he said, oh, I wasn't listening to a word that guy said. But my granddad died two weeks ago and I've just been starting to wonder what life's all about. Do you have any thoughts? It's like, yeah, I do actually. And, and we got into this chat and you know, I, I had a copy of John's Gospel. He had a copy of John's Gospel. This is what's brilliant about student mission yes. is that they put God's word into people's hands. Yep. And we got into fantastic conversation. He came back that night and actually received Christ that night. Um, and he didn't care about, you know, the, the fiery, thorny question that was his granddad had just died. And he mm-hmm. wanted to know, is there, is there hope? Mm-hmm. And ever since then, my motto has been like the guy with the microphone does not speak for the room. Mm-hmm. And we think, we think that the angriest atheist who happens to have any kind of platform that's the spiritual temperature of the nation. That's not the yeah. spiritual temperature of the no, nation. No, if you've got okay. atheist friends, they'll fall over themselves to tell you, but I'm not like Richard Dawkins. <laughs> and they've just lost their granddad. And they're wondering what life is about. And, and the, the guy with the mic does not speak for the room. So just stop trying to wrestle the mic from that guy and just turn to your neighbor because like, he's, he's got hurts and questions that mm. the gospel actually addresses. Yeah. And there's so, a, another question, sorry, from a guy I met <coughs> at a CU events week in Reading <laughs> last year. Um, so the majority of lunchtime questions seem a hangover from new atheism in the mid noughties. Mm. Do you think that's perhaps a sign that we, the church, need to read engage further with non-believers? I mean, my, my answer to that is yes, but mm. I've had the conversation with him already. <laughs> so I'll leave it to you yeah. guys to... Uh, yeah about. definitely and and certainly um m- many people within uccf for instance are, are, are getting wise to this and, and being much more creative and I, I think the the lunch bar topics are improving massively on that but i was, I was just interested like one uh, mission i went to last year and um and it was kind of on you know is jesus a feminist um and what was interesting to me is uh, if you poll Certainly among students, you'll get a much higher um, proportion of people um, claiming to be feminists, but, but something like only 8% of the UK population identifies as feminist. Um, hmm. and, we're, and we're falling over ourselves to, to get that, you know, as, as, as the hook. Um, and there was, there was that talk and, and they had one of those things with hashtags where um, the question was, what's wrong with the world? And people like put up a word and if it was voted for twice it got bigger and bigger and so you had these word clouds and it was just really interesting because you know I I did my first university mission in 2001 and then you know like 19 years later I was watching as what's wrong with the world and um, the first thing that went up was republicans (laughs) I don't know why we think US politics is the biggest problem in the world but you know in, in a UK university republicans went up and then instantly after, after that, leftists went up and then Republicans and then leftists and then Republicans and then leftists. And, mm-hmm. and actually, the, I, I think we've been, we've been chasing a whole demographic that's been shifting quite significantly in the last 10 years. And someone like a, a, a Jordan Peterson is a bellwether for all sorts of shifts that have happened from the new atheism and against 
a kind of, you know, hard leftism um, as well. And I, I don't think we've kept up with that very much. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we do seem to be on the back foot <clears throat> just as in, in general. I mean, you've got books like Jonathan Heights in your reference uh, recently, The Righteous Mind. Great book. Uh, it is a great book. I highly recommend it. But we're, we're playing catch up to where people are already at. Uh, yeah. And all the while, Jordan Peterson, well, bef- before he, he went down into lockdown earlier than the rest of us, but mm. um, before he sort of dropped off the map, um, you know, he just went and opened up Genesis and gave some really wild and woolly interpretations of, <laughs> of, of it from Jungian psychology and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, he just kind of started at Genesis 1 and worked slowly through it for hours on end and people were gripped. Um, and so like, like whatever, whatever thorn, if you invite me into your university and you give me a thorny question, even if it's, does God hate the world constantly? Um, <laughs> you just bring right. a friend along. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've got a tract. Um, we, so uh, I, d- I, like, I accept the invitation. I get up and I say, the great thing is on your tables, you've got copies of John's gospel, pick them up and let's turn to page two. And there we are. Ah, you've cracked the spine. That means it's yours. You got to take it home and you better read it. Um, and I just work my way through a passage and I, I just try. I, I, yeah. As I've said, I think apologetics is, you know, contextualized thoughtful evangelism, but I think what evangelism really is, is you open the Bible up and you point to Jesus and you say, look, look, just, you see, mm. you see, you like him. You can have him. Do you want him? That's <laughs> that's evangelism. Yeah. Well, like Philip, you know, Philip and the Ethiopian, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, we do. We I always think um, like we always seem like we're sort of roughly ten years behind with everything. <laughs> you know, like what well, I think like a really good example I've used before. I wish is, we were ten years behind. <laughs> it might be more. Don't wish, yeah. Don't you wish it was twenty <laughs> ten? <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. We really lived Um but yeah, like if, even if you think like you look at, I don't want to get into marriage, but just using marriage as an example, like when when that whole thing came on about what is marriage, like mm-hmm. we Christians, if you ask most Christians like what is marriage, I had no idea, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, like if you yeah. ask like you know, a lot of Christian guy works a bit of paper, but you know, mm-hmm. but but um, we were, we, you know, we were always we never got quite our fingers on the pulse, you know, so we're still dealing, like you said, with, you know, with. The four horsemen and the, the atheist apocalypse sort of from yeah. 2006 yeah, yeah. to 2008 yeah. and we haven't updated yeah and, and and i think a really good example is looking at you know um even if you look at tim tim keller's book if you look at what the reason for god came out in 2008 mm. it's quite that is a very very different book compared mm. to his uh, making sense of god which came out i think what last year or, or the year before they are very, very different books. A couple of years now. Maybe and and he, he's definitely got his finger on the pulse in terms of like, you know, the questions he's answering in The Reason for God are very different to the questions mm. he's answering. They're, they're mm. much more in line with what you're saying, Glenn, about meaning, purpose, identity, the kind of questions yeah. that people were actually asking, not asking, you know, you know, does yeah. God hate women? And, and uh, you know, even the hell stuff to some extent is not, you know, I, I don't really get it that often more online than, than um, mm, you know, mm. when engaging with people. But most of the questions are, you know, you know, what, you know, why am I here? Who mm. am I and how should I live? Um, yeah. Yeah. They, they yeah. seem to be the main, the main, main questions. I, th- I think this might be controversial. I, I, Tim, Tim Keller is an absolute hero of mine um, as well. But I, I think evangelistically, actually something like prodigal God mm. <laughs> or counterfeit gods, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ev- even, even with, if there's a hardened atheist to it, at least will give you, um, you know, give you seven hours to read a book. Mm. Um, I think I'd rather give them prodigal God than give them... Um, What's the, what was the latest one? The meaning one? Um, Making sense of God. Making sense of God. Yeah. Um, Counterfeit yeah. Gods is a great book. Mm. That's probably yeah. my, one of my favorite. Uh, that because I, I I think those ones are actually more um, they're more th- theological in, in that they you know they obviously start from further forward, but um, I think they're also more psychologically um, intuitive and 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 yeah they they give an account of the human person that's that I, that I think is actually richer than reason for God and, and making sense of God. Um, so yeah, I would. Yeah. That's probably, mm. And yeah. because I think he's doing law gospel in, in yeah. them. Yeah. Well, I, th- I think idolatry is such a helpful way to understand 
sin and the gospel, yeah. like working yeah. from idolatry. I think, you know, you, you start, you, you, it's not a word we, you know, we commonly use anymore, but, but when you explain it to you, you're like, oh no, that does make sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, do, do you think that part of it in your engagement with universities over the last decade or so, the questions have shifted partly because people are less biblically literate? So there's there's definitely a, a point where e- even the idea of hell or what the Bible does say about marriage, part of the reason people don't ask those questions is they don't actually know what the Bible says about it. Um, and in working with international students, I found mm. that the in- international students, you need to, it's not just what does the Bible say about something, it's what is the Bible? <laughs> what is yeah, what yeah. is Genesis? What is... Uh, yeah. Who yeah. is Jesus? And you've got sects in yeah. Japan that think that Jesus was buried in Japan. <laughs> so you, you've got yeah. who, who is Jesus? Why does he matter? Yeah. And I think even in the British in British culture, people are at that stage. At least they were when I taught in secondary schools. The, it's, I mean, even even when I was at university, I was in I was at university in the 1900s. <laughs> so, <laughs> and even even back then. Yeah, the biblical literacy was zero. I mean, yeah. I, the first one of the first people I met at university was a girl called Heidi, and she said, "Hello, my name's Heidi." And I thought I was being so clever, and I said, huh, "If there were two of you, it'd be hell." <laughs> and of course, Phil, Phil's going to get that because he's the hell guy, right? The hell guy, it's true. But, but she... <laughs> Check out the hell project. There we go. <laughs> Drop that in there. So I just and, like, you started it. It's your fault. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said, I said, if there were two of you, it'd be hell. She said, "Why?" I said, "Well, you know, Hades." She says, "What's Hades?" <laughs> I was like, "How do I dig myself out of mm. this conversation?" <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I, I don't think biblical literacy has been something that you could have relied on for fifty years. Like yeah. it's, it's, you know. It's it's certainly dropped a little bit, but it's certainly it's it hasn't been at the stage where you could assume any kind of knowledge of the gospel for for a number of generations. So, um, so what then people do is you know some that people then say, oh look, people are so far back from the gospel, we've got to meet them where they are and just talk about is there such a thing as objective truth. And then if they agree to such a thing as objective truth, we can get them to the next stepping stone and the next stepping stone and the next stepping stone. I, I, very Western. <laughs> so Western. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas I'm like, if, if they're so far from the gospel, we just need to send up like the biggest, brightest flare, like from the center of Christianity and say, this is mm. like, this is true North. This is, this is what I'm talking about. Because yeah. they, because if you engage them out here with this, what is objective truth or or whatever, they might think you're trying to take them any any which way. You know, they they just think you're trying to it's a power play, or you're just a conservative, or you're just a traditionalist, or anything. You know, so the fact that they're so far back is an opportunity just to get back to basics and say, here's Jesus. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of it as well stems from the internet as well. Maybe a lot of those objections coming from the you know. Yeah. Walk in, you know, 2006 is, you know, um, I think that's prob- probably a lot of, uh, you know, internet for atheist forums and uh, yeah. and all, all sorts of things probably yeah. accounts for some of those questions. And why is it that, that so much of evangelism and apologetics is geared towards the new atheist and not towards the new age? Yeah. And, and so instinctively, we think that the new age is a bit nuts but that the new atheists are perfectly rational. Mm-hmm. They're not perfectly rational. They, they think when, we are biological survival machines. Like, <laughs> they, literally, they think brain chemistry fizzing <laughs> explains mm. the sense of the numinous and my consciousness and, and everything. Mm. That's, that's nuts. That's far more nuts than believing in angels. Angels are actually real. You know? <laughs> I think it's just... We, it's true. Oh, sorry. Oh, Gone, you yeah. go, Glenn. Sorry. Oh, that, was no, no, no. That, that was a total <laughs> Zoom awkwardness right there. <laughs> Can you hear no. me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can't hear you now. No, I was just going to say that I, I think it's just basic, isn't it? It's like, the, the, you know, people that when you're kind of looking for signs of life, you follow, you know, noise and, and light. And, and they're the new atheists, yes. the one who are making the, the loudest noise. Yeah. And so we tend to direct all our, I think, our, our efforts, you know, the books, yeah. the 
podcast everything is 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 for them even though like you said earlier they, they probably might make up such a minute percentage yeah. of the population whereas we go to the mind body soul show that's held at alexandra palace and it's it's like the it's the biggest convention um it's, it's like you've never seen so many yoga mats in your life and like to the left of you there's reiki healing and to the right of you there's um you know all, all kinds of meditation and that sort of thing and and you know we buy a space for the long weekend and we give out gospels and we get into conversations Amazing. and there's such different conversations mm -hmm. from the the ones that we're trained to have with your normal secular you know materialist um but my goodness you can get to jesus so much quicker and you can you know the and you say can we pray with you and yeah of course you can pray with me i, w I would expect you to how much do i need to pay you for, to, to, to have the prayer and literally that's you know that's everyone else is charging 60 quid for a prayer like yeah. you know, we, yeah, we, we do it for 9.99 but, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, what sort of objections do you get in a place like that um so uh love is the window dressing that you push through into what is ultimate reality and ultimate reality is vibrations and energy and it's actually impersonal and and so what comes along with that is obviously a, a dislike for revelation a dislike for a god who would show up and be a particular way <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, because he might have opinions that, that might, you know, get in the way of me. Whereas it's far, it's far more convenient to, to deal with a, an, an energy that I can tap into mm. at, at various points. So the, the personality of God is both um, the most beautiful thing to offer and to say, uh, you know, you seem to think that love is the greatest thing, but actually you're telling me ultimate reality is totally impersonal. Yeah. It's totally this energy that you're going to dissolve into at the end of all things. Um, let me tell you about a personal God. Okay. The flip side of that is um, he has a personality <laughs> and it's not yours. Yeah. And in order to have a relationship, there needs to be give and take. And, you know, you therefore need to change or repent. Um, so th there's also all sorts of um, flashpoints around that. But yeah, let me, let me think. It must be because yeah. I, I really wouldn't, very, very seldom I've ever spoken to anyone uh, new age, not, not through, you know, active avoidance, just, mm. um, just, it's just never really occurred. Mine tends to be, you know, atheists, hum, humanists, uh, and Muslims tend to be feminists. Yeah, yeah. And yet, the, you know, they, they reckon probably 4 million people in the UK think that coronavirus has something to do with 5G. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of people. It's a lot I know of a few of them. A lot of people. The, uh, a lot of Christians, unfortunately, got caught hmm. get caught up in that. Hmm. Yeah. What What is it? It's not really related to evangelism, but uh, at least sort it's of all anecdotal. related to the <laughs> evangel, Daniel. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> at, le at least <laughs> that's the whole point of this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put it under the umbrella of culture and call it culture. Yeah, yeah. Culture. So, <laughs> at least anecdotally, like a lot of a lot of the conspiracy theory stuff. Mm is coming from my Christian, a lot of Christian friends, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, it's not that we've, we've got friends who are not Christians who some sort of conspiracy stuff, mm -hmm. but a lot, a lot of it, like 90% is from Christians, isn't it? What yeah. is it about, are we a, a Christian sort of predisposed to mm -hmm. yep. believe, believe in this type of stuff? Like what, what? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, which is a strength and a weakness. And it's been... It's been a strength wherever and whenever the church has been a minority and when um, the government is a tyrannical force that is not to be trusted. Mm. Um, Christians have always had a healthy um, suspicion of the beast mm -hmm. um, and a healthy and a, a knowledge that those who pretend to be in charge of reality aren't really. Yeah. Um, and I, I think a lot of modern conspiracy theories um, sound very much like Gnosticism um, to the point where David Icke even talks about like archons and things, which is, which is classical Gnosticism back from the, you know, first, second, third centuries. Um, they talk about these spiritual powers and these angels and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and conspiracy theories are very much like Gnosticism in, in which you have secret sects that need to initiate you into the mysteries 
And you don't want to be one of these carnal people. You want to be a wise one, a spiritual one, and you need to be inducted into the secret knowledge. Um, and so that you won't, you know, be duped by what the world is presenting to you. Mm -hmm. And and this is what conspiracy theories are like. And interestingly, you know, in the New Testament, the authors are constantly um, engaging with kind of a proto-Gnosticism. You, you think of Colossians or in Corinthians or 2 Peter. Um, I love it in, two, in, in Colossians chapter 2. Um, Paul seems to have these sort of proto-Gnosticists in mind when he says, um, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in mm. Christ. Mm. And it's, it's, it's fascinating. I, I think he is engaging with, with that kind of thinking that, oh, there, yeah. there is a, there's a secret cartel that's in charge of the universe. And, and Paul basically says, you're right. It's, it's father, son, and spirit. They're running the universe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, mm. the world really is run by a Jew. Really? <laughs> like, it's, it's true. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. And the, pe and the people you quote. think. <laughs> I'm going to pull that out and stick that on Twitter. That's amazing. <laughs> Rip it out of context. Look at this yeah, guy. Yeah, I'm toast. I'm to <laughs> and you need to wear purple shell suits. <laughs> I will pray for you for 9.99. Have I not made that clear? Yeah, right, so yeah, that's what we're so, selling. And so the Apostle Paul, what he doesn't do is he doesn't say, "Oh, don't be so silly. There's no, there's no secret knowledge out there. Mm. Everything is is very open." And, and you know, Boris Johnson, of course, is in charge of the United Kingdom, and Donald Trump, of course, is in charge of the United States. But Christians know that's not true, right? We we know that there are principalities and powers. We sh we ought to know that, and we ought to know that even above those angelic principalities and powers there is a father-son union in the spirits that is there's really at work but what paul says is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in christ and so there is something that is on display to the world and what is on display to the world is jesus and his way of the cross which is you know the the reverse of the way of the world and it's and it's all about you know self-denial and giving yourself for others and and this is why it's a secret knowledge, <laughs> mm. not because I need to pay a lot of money or be an in, inducted into a whole bunch of uh, of mysteries, but it's because my flesh hates the way of the cross and, and I refuse I refuse this way of wisdom the way of Jesus, but it is it is the thing that's running the world. Apparently the the meek will inherit the earth. This is mm. this is the thing that's gonna that's that's really at work in the world. We refuse to believe that, but that is the secret knowledge that's at the heart of all things. So I, 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 so I think Christians, Christians were susceptible to Gnosticism in the, in, in the first few centuries. They continue to be susceptible to conspiracy theories because we kind of know that, that the authorities aren't really in, in charge. At the same time, we're told to um, honor them and pray for them and you know pay taxes to them and, and all the rest of it. And we're told you know, don't concern yourself with the archons, concern yourself with Christ, who is the head. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there are very good reasons why, why Christians are more susceptible to conspiracy theories. And I think the answer, again, is the gospel. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of it uh, in that depth. That makes a lot of sense. I think the deeper side I got was just kind of connecting that um, it, it tends, uh, at least from my own context seemed to be quite a protestant thing which seemed to make sense given mm. protestant arose from a rebellion and, and distrust of authority and so uh, we're sort of naturally inclined as a as a group to kind of be you know not not naturally trustful of authority and what, what we're told you know that there's a, a yeah. you know truth needs to be it's not necessarily in the place of authority yeah yeah all, all cults are hyper protestant aren't they yeah 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 yeah. It seems there's uh, there's an interesting article shared on around from Atlantic.com about QAnon and from this whole anonymous Q that people are following and leaves breadcrumbs on the internet that people have to decipher and they, they figure out. And there's been a whole bunch of high profile failures of this prophetic Q. But um, it was interesting that there's quite a few Christians caught up in that as well. If you look up the Gospel Coalition's post on it, they get the Twitter responses are actually kind of hilarious but also worrying because yeah. you've got so many people go, oh but this guy quotes scripture this guy it's not like satan did that but anyway the 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 duped by almost yeah the, the fake scripture references or the, the real scripture references but used badly then it seems to be they're, they're caught up oh this is my mission this is my 
purpose. I found the secret knowledge and, and mm. Jesus mm. gave me my purpose, but this is part of it because he's quoted scripture at me and shown me the, shown me the true way. Um, and all of that, yes. it just becomes really messy. I, I don't know how much QAnon is in the UK. It must be a little bit just because we seem to absorb some element of American mm. Christianity. Yeah. I think it's a little, it's not much at the moment, but I'm hyper aware that it could be a lot more over time, partly because everyone, I mean, they, they have the, the big, the big dogs, the Tim Kellers, the, the gospel coalition stuff, the John yeah. Pipers, and we don't seem to get our English <laughs> preachers out as, as far and wide as maybe we should for whatever reason that might be. Yeah. 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 I blame Luther. It's true. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the toothpaste was out of, out of the tube with the Reformation. And um, yeah, how many tens of thousands of denominations are there? Yeah, mm. too many. So with, with the, I, I just think we don't want to be referred to as the clickbait critical witness. So one of the mm. parts of the title mm. was um, Mr. Cummings and how, and I, I just want to say, if you haven't seen Glenn's video on, the whole debacle around Mr. Cummings. Uh, it is a very good video. You did mention that it might have been too long, but um, I thought it was, I thought it was, I thought it was good. And I, I just wanted to highlight it because it is a good use of every what's happening today in culture and bringing about both the secular reasons. I like the you brought in Jonathan Haidt into that, and then you also brought in the gospel. So I that's quite a skill. It's something that Tim Keller has, but I've, I saw that in your debate with Dillahunty as well. The, the quip when he started saying he could reason with Hitler, he brought in, I thought that was hilarious, but you just like, Oh, you're like, um, Chamberlain. Is it Chamberlain? Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. The, yeah, yeah. Peace in our time. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, just that sort of ability to bring in cultural elements to both. And that, that's a form of apologetics in my mind. What, what just mockery reckon? really yeah <laughs> in, the, in the style of elijah it's, oh it's so polite <laughs> it's done so well so oh, for those listening also for for us just what kind of things have you done to develop that skill to recognize what's happening in culture and just pull out bits of truth that can point people to to jesus because I don't start with culture, I, you know, like I, my goal is not to to think, oh, what's going on in the cultural zeitgeist, and how can I then build a bridge from that into my, you know, trite little understanding of the gospel, which is so often what kind of happens. People go yeah. like, what's popular these days? Oh, fidget spinners. Um, I I know uh, they're like the Trinity, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> which it happens a lot. Or people, you know. Like people talk about the latest fad, whatever it is, you know, Tamagotchi or Pokemon Go or Face App or let's, you know, and people think I, I know I need I need to start with a culture and, and come in. I, I, I really don't think that's the way I, I do think you start with um, hopefully a profound view of Jesus and in Jesus, his vision of God, his vision of the world, his vision of the human person. And, and from that, I think that gives you the lenses to then look at what's going on in the culture. Um, I hope that's what's going on because, you know, when I think if you have a rich anthropology, doctrine of man, what are, what are we like? And if you like Tim Keller, for instance, and you, and you think the prodigal God is um, a really helpful paradigm, well, Tim Keller will, will point out to you that there are two ways of being a sinner. There is the younger brother way of transgression and there is the elder brother way of self-righteous pride. And both of those are a problem. And Jesus is something else. And he's not, he's not the transgressor and he's not the proud rule keeper. He's something else. Okay, you've got that paradigm. That's a, that's a rich theological understanding grounded in Jesus. You've got those lenses on. Now you look at the Dominic Cummings thing. And you've got someone who may have transgressed, if not the letter of the law, at least the spirit of the law. <laughs> and you're like, well, where'd you get that phrase from? Um, that's totally biblical. Okay. But okay. You've got Cummings 
let's say he did transgress the law. Then you got a whole bunch of other people who have kept the law and they, they are saying, we feel like we've been made mugs. You know, that mm -hmm. Richard Osman tweeted that out. And if you search on Twitter for um, he's made mugs of us all, like, like just countless tweets, countless tweets. Lots of people are feeling um, foolish and stupid and ashamed that they had made such sacrifices um, when this rule breaker had, you know, po-faced liar had, had gotten away with that. Mm -hmm. And you and you look again at the culture through those lenses, and, you, and I think you see riches that you don't ordinarily see, either if you look at it through, through a purely secular lens, or if you just look at it through a conservative, you know, religious lens. The conservative religious lens just comes out like the bishops came out and said, there are rules. God gave us rules, and he broke the rules. Mm -hmm. um, like, yeah, well, that's, that's one well, that's one part of the analysis. There's also an entire nation that is invested in keeping the rules to the degree that if you don't keep the rules, you die. We are so, so existentially like invested in rule keeping. And what, what's fascinating mm -hmm. is I look at the, the studies and almost, almost exactly the same proportion of people are on either ends of these things. 28% of people um, admit to breaking lockdown um, regulations. It's probably much higher, but 28% will admit to that. 28%, yeah. exact same number, 28% say that even if the government meets all five of its targets, they don't want lockdown to be eased. Um, there are, you know, so at one end of the things, there are, there are people who are breaking the laws. At the other end of the things, so many of the people I know have locked themselves down more than the rules say they should. Like I, I live in Eastbourne and, um, you know, thankfully I, I can walk to the beach and that's fantastic. But I, I almost on a daily basis, I meet people from other parts of Eastbourne and they're sheepish about being at the beach because they drove to get to the beach. Mm -hmm. And almost universally, they, they think they've been naughty um, in doing that, they don't realize that, of course, you can drive to the, you can drive to the, you can drive a few miles to, to, to get somewhere nice to walk. Of course you can do that. Mm -hmm. That's totally allowed. But that is news to so many people. I, I think it's not just that there are dirty, filthy lockdown breakers out there. Um, there is a huge, there are millions and millions of people who have locked themselves down more than they had needed to. Well, that's interesting. And if you're psychologically invested in that mm -hmm. and you've made sacrifices well, that's interesting. Can we, can we think theologically and biblically about people who continually make sacrifices, make sacrifices, make sacrifices for the sake of the nation, for the sake of the nation, for the sake of the nation, and, and then it might turn out, you know, that that wasn't the main thing, you know? Hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it's, inter it's interesting. I, I, I put that out there. Um, and so, you know, so you start to think, you start to think about a doctrine of man, and, and you start to think about, a theology, an anthropology, and a, and, a, and a theology, and you know, just on on Twitter today, I kind of came up with, there, you know, there are ten things that our culture assumes. Whether you think Dominic Cummings is Satan himself, or whether you think he's a dad who did the best he could, um, here are ten things that every everybody already believes. We all, we already believe number one, you shouldn't be wise in your own eyes. That there is a law above us. We all believe that there is a spirit as well as a letter of the law. We all believe that there is complete equality, whatever your race or station in life, that we are all one. Uh, we all believe that hypocrisy is intolerable. We all believe that self-justification is ugly. We all believe that admitting your errors is a strength. We all believe that rulers are not above the law. They should put themselves under it. We all believe that leaders are servants, ministers even. We all believe that no one should lord it over others. And we all believe that self-sacrifice, even falling on your sword, even falling on your sword if you were innocent, that that could be the very noblest thing to do. We all believe those things, even though most of those things are nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Most of those things are totally non-obvious. And, you know, if you read a, a Tom Holland for long enough, you'll, you'll see, you know, not only the way he characterizes the Greco-Roman world or the Persian world or the Muslim world, in which all those 10 things would be, well, most of those 10 things would be pretty much nuts. And then you come to Tom Holland's book, Dominion, and you see actually mm. Christianity is why we believe all 10 of those things. Mm. So we're all 
basically as assuming we, we're all standing on the Bible, hurling verses at each other. We've just forgotten the references. Um, we're all incredibly Christian um, about it, you know, and, and we, it's just a whole bunch of secularized Bible bashing that's going on. You know, in the culture. So what, um, I know we mentioned this earlier before um, during the day, but um, how does it's it's kind of almost a toxic conversation even amongst uh, Christians. I've noticed that sort of posting on Facebook about it yesterday, just sort of inquiring about what I meant to think about Dominic Cummings. <laughs> I, was still, I was still a bit uncertain after some of the things I read last week turned out not to be true. Um, yeah. Right. So I was just trying to figure out what I meant to think. And um, I still find myself very, it's very hard. I find it very hard to get worked up about it in, in the way that I know a number of other people feel, feel very, very strongly about it. But um, it'd be interesting if you just sort of explore a bit about, um, I don't know, the absence of forgiveness. Mm. Um, like I know um, I, I was flicking through, uh, I've read it, but it just reminded me uh, earlier to about Douglas Murray's book, The Madness of Crowds. Have yeah, you read yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, it's hilarious. Yeah, it's on my list of readers. Yeah, it's it's an excellent book, and he has hilarious whole, and scary at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, he has a, a section. I think one of the titles is uh, the chapters is on forgiveness. So the whole chapter is about um, you know the ways. In which I think he uses um, Nietzsche as an example, kind of saying that Nietzsche kind of foresaw that that we would have the remnants of of, of Christian theology about this need for forgiveness and redemption. And once you remove the legitimacy of the Christian account, you were left with the remnants of guilt and shame. But there was no, there was no, there was no, um, there, there was no, no way of, to get out of that yeah, cycle. Yeah, you know, there's no, no there was no means yeah. in culture for you to escape yeah. that cycle of guilt and shame. And it yeah. very much feels like, you know, this is the the kind of if, if he was writing his book in a month, you know, a few months time, he would be using this example as an mm -hmm. example of how you know, you know, as a scapegoat. There's so many biblical kind mm. of themes you can get out right. of this. Yeah, like Dominic Cummings as the scapegoat for our, you know, for our anger and, you know, the coronavirus and the, the government and, you know, all these sorts of things. He's to blame. Yeah, and, and, and it does, for me, it feels very much like he's, I'm not saying he hasn't done anything wrong, but I'm saying that my understanding is some of the, 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 um, toxicity and, and the anger and the hatred is uh over the top totally um, totally and 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 the absence of any notion of forgiveness and, and and redemption just screams out to me um and um yeah but interesting yeah, but, kind of but thoughts the on flip side the flip side the absence of you know repentance or any kind of yes yeah, 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 from, yeah, 100%. from dominic um yeah and you might, and you know, the, the comeback to that for those who are on Dominic Cummings' side would, would say, well, you never apologize to the mob. Never apologize to the mob. That, that seems to be um, the, the, the sort of conservative wisdom that, that people have. And I just, I, I would just question that. Yeah, I, it, it's hard not to think of the media encamped around him as a mob and a, a particularly deranged mob mm -hmm. that is very clearly breaking social distancing in order to accuse him of breaking social distancing. Yeah. And the appalling hypocrisy of that is on show. Mm. <laughs> what did Dominic Cummings do? What did he not do? Um, did he have a full tank of petrol? Did he fill up here? Did he fill up there? Um, th th there is, you know, room for disagreement on, on all of that. There is no room for disagreement on how hypocritical the media have been. Yeah. No room for disagreement on that. Well, apparently it's their job. It's essential because you've got to get that competitive. <laughs> you've got to get that competitive photo, haven't you? And if they if they don't, I know that was a response I, I got. I just didn't know how to re respond to that. It, well, then you know, in bizarre. the in the rose in the rose garden, you know, he had one journalist after another. Why didn't they just you know commission one photographer to take one photo? How, how many yeah. you know people do you need? If if <laughs> we're looking the down jobs. the jobs, thinking of the country. jobs. <laughs> we're looking down the entire country we can't figure out one photographer to take one picture and license it um so you know um there's wrong there's lots of wrongdoing on on every side it would be so fantastic to hear 
Dominic Cummings say sorry? Mm. Yes. Oh. Yeah, would. Agreed. Oh, Agreed. Would, Agreed. Wouldn't it be agree. amazing? And, and, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if he was sacked? Like, and, and wouldn't it be amazing even if he hadn't done anything wrong? And, okay, we can let him be Jesus for a bit. Okay, <laughs> so he's fallen on his sword and the mob got its way. But maybe God can, you know, raise up a truth teller and do good out of it. I, you know, may, maybe, maybe, you know, you know, the, the whole, you, you never ask, you never apologize to the mob thing. Maybe that's, maybe that's right. But what did Jesus do to the, to the mob? And there was a stillness and there was a silence that allowed the mob to reveal its own evil in a self-destructive way. And the, you know, even if Dominic Cummings did everything right on the way up to Durham and back, um, there are definitely better ways um, he could have um, handled that. And yeah, so, but it, it is so difficult. It is so difficult to have um, conversations about about any of this. There, are, but what I do think is that, um, whereas many people, the majority of people, will have a knee jerk reaction to this and just default to type because we we all. We all do have types, you know, some are, I'm incredibly risk averse. I'll just do really risky things. And so lockdown for me, I'm yeah, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I shouldn't be like that. And that's, that's no excuse, but I'm, I'm always going to default to, if a friend told me I, I drove up to Durham to self-isolate with my family. Cause you know, there was the availability of childcare. I'd be like, yeah. Um, and that's just temperamentally how I'm wired. And there would be temperamentally, you know, people who would hear that and they would be outraged, you know, and then you add into it who Dominic Cummings is and what this represents and you, you get everything else. But to ignore um, psychology is, is silly. Um, and there'll be, there'll be the majority of people who you can't have a normal conversation with on these things. Unfortunately, that is the case, but for, for some people, um, I think they are sensing that more is going on than meets the eye and that um, the issues that are involved are, are far beyond rational explanation. And your one or two friends who you can talk to, I think are really pricking up mm. and starting to, to ask the deep questions. So yes, it's it's very difficult with the majority, but again, it's you know the guy with the mic does not speak from the room. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The Turn to your neighbour; they've just lost their, their granddad. The thing about the mob, I think you know, not not apologising to the mob works as a general rule, uh, but it's not an exceptionless one because I think sometimes the mob's right. Mm. Right. Um, right. And I, and I think that's the danger of having a rule like that because I've heard that I've, I've you know read relatively widely across sort of political spectrum. It's quite a sort of right-wing conservative thing to say and never apologize to the mob yes. but that that that's it's very simplistic as, as I said, sometimes the mob's right you know uh, yes. and, and sometimes yes. the right thing to do is to apologize um, yes and uh, yeah it's it's just yeah. but they've just buckled down on it I, mean, I i stopped watching the briefing after about five 10 maybe 10 minutes partly because of the horn that was going on behind it did anyone else get that there was someone mm. Mm. yeah yeah horn yeah behind, and i just couldn't concentrate on what he was actually saying that was one thing that stopped me from watching it but it was just so mundane <laughs> it was like the most right. Mild right thing ever it was like a trial yeah. but a really yeah. boring <laughs> forum scene. I was like, yeah what have I just yeah yeah onto? this is the most ridiculous thing i drove up to durham i then went to a castle we sat in a park for five minutes we didn't come into contact with anyone yeah what? yeah what yeah. is this when yeah. it could have been five yeah. minutes i did this because i cared for my child i clearly made an error huh ah ah of judgment See, that, that, or, yeah that or was something. yeah yeah <laughs> that would have helped something that you're clearly offended by and that's my error of judgment <laughs> and i apologize yeah. that you're upset yeah i yeah. went against some guidelines that i i knew better than you because yeah he, he wrote them and i thought i was following the guidelines to the best of my ability but i apologize yeah. that others have made greater sacrifices and it doesn't have to be like a falling on your sword <laughs> there's ways of apologizing mm. yeah. and i'm sure script writers would write a better apology than than me but just to yeah. sit in a garden and go i went to a castle and didn't <laughs> touch anyone and it's bizarre yeah yeah 
and if he had said that, I, I think then the next the next line would be, and I am offering my resignation to Boris Johnson, and it's and the ball's in his court. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Does does yeah. he think that I did Absolutely. anything wrong? And he is as the prime minister of the nation, um, mm. because it does seem it's I don't know, um, him. Yeah, him keeping him on. It's it's either an incredibly um, uh, it's an incredible amount of integrity. You can, <laughs> like if it is indeed true that Dominic Cummings did nothing right, you could think that it's, it's an incredible amount of integrity from from Boris Johnson to not give in to the mob and 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 to stand for truth. Like <laughs> like if it is indeed the case that Dominic Cummings did nothing right, then Boris Johnson is is has far more integrity than the majority of, of, you know, those who were polled by the daily mail today, um, who are all saying that he should resign and all, all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, but it's so much of it comes down to what does Dominic Cummings represent? Cause as, as you say, you know, Phil, it's a really dull story until it's Dominic Cummings. Okay. Mm-hmm. So who is Dominic Cummings? Okay. He's one of the elites yep. that will take you in a certain direction or he's Mr. Brexit. Mm, that'll take you in another direction or <laughs> he's a guy who's been dreadful to the media in the past and he has um, that'll take you in another direction mm. or he's a father doing the best for his family mm. that'll take you in another direction and it, could be, it could be that one because he's elite and no elite loves their children so. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait did i just that's another kind of words. Uh, what um yeah. i was just trying to think of how um, time wise are we we oh, well, to... we're, we're at an hour 15. We're aiming for three hours. <laughs> yeah, let's go, let's go totally Joe Rogan. I, I, might, I might get in trouble for that one. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good for however long I'm you want to go. Oh, fine. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's just interesting. I mean, there, there's so many conversations that are, um, that get toxic like this. And I, and I really wish that everyone could just be delivered a copy of The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. Mm-hmm. and we'd all have a little bit more awareness about our own confirmation bias and and um you i don't know. have confirmation bias then. no that's and that's that's a, no no one does <laughs> as it's so it's, it's, so, it's everything it's just yeah, it is. <laughs> It's um, and I, can you, can you imagine if this, this everyone is why else I is using Twitter because I, I write stuff like this and it doesn't work in 280 characters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so much you need trouble. to do more winky emojis. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, even, even and then, claps and claps, claps as well. Oh, claps, it's all about, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, no, you're not allowed to do that actually. I mm-hmm. think why? I've, I think it's, it's cultural appropriation. I think the oh, is claps, it? Yeah, I think, oh, right. I think even if they're yellow hands, no, oh, okay, yeah, I don't, I don't think <laughs> the Simpsons get really even annoyed. Simpson hands. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's not on. Um, I, don't, I have a couple, couple of questions, sort of well, not necessarily related to this. Well, actually, no. Let's go back to Matt Dillahunty. Mm. What? Now, now, you you did that. I thought you did a great job. Um, you don't seem so sure. Um, mm. What What would you have done differently? Hmm. I'd have worked on my poker face a little bit more. Um, so when <laughs> oh, he, what, was, what was it? You did the long, Gregory S. Paul. Long... Yeah. He, <laughs> yeah. He. He he quoted this. He quoted this one study that he always quotes and has yeah. quoted for the last fifteen years, and he's never got the source right ever in in his career. I've actually got a video. One one of these days, I might post it of just clipping together all the times he's ever mentioned Gregory S. Paul, <laughs> and he and he cites it from a different made up journal every time, mm. and he he never quite gets the name right. Um, and he just did it. He just did it again. I was I was just so yeah, shocked that, that he was he would. He would basically quote from this guy um, who did a did a, a single univariate analysis of uh, religiosity um, and the, the health of society. And you know, one of the things you need to know about Gregory S. Paul is that he's a paleontologist. Although he's really not a paleontologist, he's actually an illustrator, best known for his drawings of sauropods. Um, that is sentence number one in Wikipedia, and it just gets better from there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yet yet again, you know, I, I you know I, I brought up you know, various studies that, that, you know, give a positive correlation between intrinsic religiosity and societal health. And he mentioned Gregory S. Paul again, and I, I, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I need to work on my poker face because um, I just, I jumped on it <laughs> a little, a little <laughs> bit much. Um, I, I found it amusing. There was that wonder, wonderful, um, what was the, there was something that you did a meme to that you just ended up repeating over. You oh, were, annoying you, head bob. That's the um, one. Yeah. 
I love it. Yeah. It, was, it was one of the 15,000 comments. There were 15,000 comments on this video. <laughs> And yeah, there's a point where the camera's on me and I'm, I'm, I've got my listening face and, and then, and then yeah. yeah, in his, in his comment, he just said 38 minutes, 15 seconds, <laughs> the I'm a jerk head Bob. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it. Yeah. I'm scrolling down. I see that comment and I click on, you know, 38 minutes, 15 seconds of like, that is the I'm a jerk head. Bob. <laughs> it's, plain, it's plainly what you were thinking as well. <laughs> I'm a jerk. Yeah. Mm, mm, I'm a big jerk. <laughs> it's been it's been viewed nearly a quarter of a million times now. I looked today. Yeah, only, so Jordan just... only on Premier, only Jordan Peterson has been viewed more. So I mean, it's all Matt Dillahunty's audience. It's all you know. So the one thing I knew when Justin Briley, well, yeah, a couple of things I knew when Justin Briley phoned up is there's quite a number of other Christians who've uh, <laughs> tried to dodge this bullet. <laughs> yes. And now Justin's <laughs> asked me. <laughs> I, I, I thought you, I think that speaks actually the number of stats because I, th I thought just it showed the true colors of following atheism to its logical yes, conclusion. I thought so too. And I, I'm surprised you didn't jump on it more that the whole, I, I thought <laughs> Justin's bringing in the, the what, was, what was that law like, when you bring in Godwin's <laughs> law. <laughs> Mate, it, it worked so it just it really did. All, all the atheists were on on the comments like, oh, how dare he bring in Hitler? But look at what yeah. Matt Hitler Hunty did with it. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. Like, if he doesn't agree with me, I'll just kill him. <laughs> so yeah, uh, that's on what problem. basis? <laughs> on what basis? On what grounds? You know. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. So yeah. So Justin Briley invoked Godwin's law, and for once it clarified rather than you know mm -hmm. just just added it added heat and light. And, you know, I mean, I had some terrific moments in that debate. None of them were when I was speaking um, because, I mean, Justin raised Hitler and then Matt just, he dug a pit and he fell in it. He, he nosedived into it gleefully. Um, you know, I, I believe that, you know, um, people have value. They don't have intrinsic value. Um, you know, and, and, he, and he was talking about, um, uh, uh we, we talk about, you know, what if a Hitler figure wanted to eliminate a subgroup of the, of the population because they're holding us back. Um, and he said, well, you don't want to do that because they might come up with a cure for cancer or create great works of art. So you don't want to do that. And then Justin, again, like I say, the best moments in the debate were not coming out of my mouth. <laughs> it was either Justin or his. And just, Justin said, um, but what if they don't cure cancer or create great works of, of, of art? Isn't it valuable just having them? And he said, no, you've got to contribute value. And I clarified and I said, so, so people don't have value. They've got to contribute value. He's like, yes, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Well, I, th yeah. I think that's, that's a testament. Like, you asked the question, that's a clarifying question. And I, that, mm. to have that in the heat at the moment is really poignant because that is just an awful worldview. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's garbage. It's garbage. It's, it's absolutely. I mean, and that's, yeah. that's partly why i think so i don't tend to watch too many debates all the way through i tend to get a little bit bored when they go down the philosophy route but i found this riveting because it deals with something that's partly personal to me because i, I have a daughter who probably would be in that mark and mm. it's just this is outrageous yeah. this is the problem and that, and actually it's a cultural underlying that we're seeing and some of your i would say most uh powerful videos have been around the abortion debate is is we've got this idea that disability is has got to be eliminated it, it is mm -hmm. the undercurrent and it's either yeah. on the young end or the old end but we in the middle are safe even though mm -hmm. there's that precipice somewhere down the line i'm yeah. no longer going to be add value yeah. so where 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 does where do i fit on this yeah and, and yeah. I, I just thought you ha you handled it really well i mean it, you could have mm. just i think i'd have struggled to maintain <laughs> yeah. sense of decency when there was, there was a point in the debate where he was like saying this kind of stuff and i was like you'd be you'd be happy with that yeah yeah you'd be happy with that and then he mocked me he was like yeah 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 <laughs> it's like literally i'm trying to process yeah. what you just said the genocidal logic that you've just mm. put out there into the world i'm, I'm mm. you know yeah so i mean before before going into the debate I, I believe on a theological level, it's Jesus or the pit. Mm -hmm. But I believe that on a societal level, after my debate with Matt Dillahunty, because literally 
in explicitly walking away from Jesus, you are explicitly walking into a world where power is king and the weak can take the hindmost. You're, you're walking into hell, mm -hmm. you know? So it, oh man, it, it clarified so many things mm -hmm. for me, just, just doing the debate. Like, like I say, I, I just sat back and, you know, just, Justin raised Hitler and, and Matt did the rest of the work himself. And, it, and it, was, it, it was clarifying for me. And I think it's been clarifying for many people, atheists included. Um, so yeah, I pray, I pray it does some good. Mm. I think, I think um, I, know, I just seem to be cautious about necessarily describing that as the atheist view, mm. um, yeah. only because oh. a number. You know, Sorry, it, I got it, carried it, away. It, it, that's all right, but you know, it's, it's, it's definitely it's definitely one mm. um, one yeah. one outcome. Um, yeah. but obviously, e equally, I, I, like, like we've been kind of saying, probably ninety nine percent of people who say they're atheists and agnostics do not think that. No, but they're, yeah. they're very much. Yeah. You know, they 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 have you know, remnants of that Judeo-Christian morality. They can't necessarily ground it probably mm -hmm. in, a, in a, I would, you know, I'd argue in a coherent sort of ontology, mm -hmm. but they would, um, they would be closer to us than to someone like Matt Dillahunty. I think even then someone think, like Tom Holland yeah. would say, and the reason for that is yes. Christianity. And, yes. and they are far more Christian than they know. But I don't even what... think Matt Dillahunty would shoot Hitler. I think that's just bravado in a debate. I think he's got more morality than that. I think he would think it was the moral thing to do. And I, and I think resisting the evildoer, um, however we do it, non-violently, violently, what, yeah. you know, what, whichever way we do it, I think you want to get to the stage where you can resist the evildoer yeah. um, and you have the right to resist them that they do not have because they forfeited that right because they are evil. Yeah. But Matt Dillahunty can never yeah. do that because he mm -hmm. can never conclude that he's evil. It's a corrupted Bonhoeffer. He, he's he's recognised <laughs> as evil, mm. but he doesn't want to label it evil. Mm. So th th that underlying statement showed the very thing he's trying to deny, mm -hmm. um, which I, I thought was fascinating. But or, yeah, or, right, that, right. or that actually it is just will to power in the end. Mm. Yeah, he did. He doesn't particularly like Hitler's kind of society, so he'll kill him. Yeah, you know, and and that's well, okay, that's what we do in this society these days. I guess yeah. we just eliminate those we don't like. Okay. But is that yeah, an aesthetic yeah. judgment or is it a moral judgment? And if it's a moral judgment, is it supercultural? How is it supercultural? You know, is there a transcendent, you know, objective moral realm? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what? So what? What? What else might have you done a little bit different, differently? Because again, you you seem whenever when I've ever I've mentioned it, you seem you know your face you know your expressions anyway come it seem quite negative. But I don't think I don't know. Maybe are you being hard on yourself? Because I think most Christians sure. I've discussed with seem mm. to have viewed how you manage that debate with Matt actually really, really positively. And I haven't heard, you know, the comments obviously don't correspond to that uh, with regards to the no. sort of atheist community. But no. uh, most, you know, I don't think, I think the concern with um, doing a debate like that representing the Christian side is that you, it must, I, I can't imagine the type of pressure that must put on your shoulders in, in, in a way, in, in a way, only because yeah. you're kind of defending the Christian side and um i don't know concerns about letting the side down and something like that but i don't i don't think yeah. there's any semblance to that i don't i, don't I think, think i think i would that. do if like if any if anybody cared anything about glenn scrivener if, if if i had any kind of like name or reputation i think i would care more i you right. know I, I went into that as the total unknown so i i had nothing to lose he had everything to lose mm. you know he he walked off a plane into a christian studio where you know, even the moderator was going to bring up Hitler against him. <laughs> that is very good, yeah. And he knew nothing about me. I knew everything about him. Mm -hmm. Everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, so, and he's had a really rough year. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think I won the debate. I mm -hmm. do. Um, if, if we're going to call it a debate, if we're going to, you know, say there, there are winners. Only in that, the, you know, the topic was, can atheism deliver a better world? And he kept on saying, I have no idea. But then whenever he articulated the kind of society that his beliefs led to, it sounded like hell to me. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 so, you know, would I, would I do things differently? Yeah, I'd definitely do things differently. Um, I'm, but I, but I think I'm an evangelist rather than a debater. And I think that an evangelist lets things go through to the keeper to use a cricketing analogy. Um, so if you don't no, no cricket, you know, you, you don't play every ball that comes to you. You only, yeah. you only play the balls that are on target. 
-hmm. and the balls that are just wide of the target, you just let go through to the keeper. If it's not exactly on topic, leave it alone, leave it alone. Whereas in a debate, you always feel like you've got to rebut every single point somebody makes mm -hmm. up, uh, yeah. brings up. And so, you know, I, I don't know if I got those decisions right because he was constantly bringing up stuff about, you know, the Bible is a misogynistic text that, you know, mm -hmm. um, affirms slavery. And you can't, you know, you can't say that it doesn't. And I, I let most of those go through the keeper. Um, yeah. And, you know, may, maybe in a debate, it was my duty to engage that and, and give at least a 30 second response before moving on to the point that I wanted to make. So yeah. that, that could have been something I, I, I could have done differently. Um, yeah. What else? There, there are definitely things I would have done. So he, um, <laughs> he, he um, gave me the most, um, the funniest hypothetical situation. He says, you know, so I'm, I'm Hitler, change my mind. Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't believe in human value, change my mind. Yeah which is the weirdest Steven Crowder episode ever. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I kind of have a go at, you know, trying to tug at his heartstrings, this Hitler figure, um, which uh, that was playing into his hands really yeah. stupidly. I, I should have just gone, uh, no. <laughs> I don't, I don't. If you want to eliminate um, the disabled, you're already self-condemned as wicked. Mm. yeah i don't need i don't need to argue with that like yeah. that that's it you're yeah. already an evildoer i already have the right to resist you mm -hmm. yeah we don't need to have the symposium yeah and what's interesting i've been thinking about the deal hunting debate um recently with with regards to you know matt matt's been matt was you know kind of saying i would sit down with the hitler figure mm. and i would you know you present your data i'll present my data we'll see which kind of system leads to the flourishing of society better and and we'll be able to agree on some things and we'll be we'll we'll, we'll thrash out the data and i've been thinking about that since since lockdown and since the statistics around coronavirus and and how do you fight coronavirus and what's the best tactic you know and what the science says and I'm just, I'm just imagining, you know, can you sit down and have a symposium about something like much more straightforward? Like, how do we deal with this illness? Mm -hmm. We don't know how to do that. How do we, you know, what's, what's the best way of dealing with climate change? We don't know how to do that. Like, yeah. all, all our examples of symposiums are like, we have absolutely no idea. Mm -hmm. Are you really going <laughs> to um, bring genocide <laughs> to mm -hmm. that same level of, let's have a think about this. Let's see what the science says. Yeah. Um, it's totally un unworkable. Is is something I'm not sure if I've read it or picked it up somewhere, but it, it very much seems to me that new atheism is it has the Christian idea of a progress in the sense that humanity can be rescued, but they've removed the rescuer and the bedrock of that hope. Hmm. So it's it's a totally hopeless hope. It's a naive hope that, and we're we're accused of wishful thinking when actually the atheist that has a view of Matt Dillahunty's is this idea, and I, I remember thinking of Richard Dawkins in The God Delusion, this idea that humanity can save itself. I don't see that anywhere. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, and I, I've come across a couple of Christians that have picked that up a little bit, that if you go full praetorism, you probably have that. Everything's fulfilled, but we're getting better. Um, mm. And uh, I, mm. I find that interesting about humanism, that they've, they've removed hope, yet they still cling to something. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that, that we can make ourselves better when everything around them, the science, is we're failing at that. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, you know, it depends. Do you do you think well, your well-being statistics were, were interesting? Stephen Pinker and yeah. Uh, do you believe in Stephen Pinker or not? And, you know, and the better yeah. nature of our angels and and you know, I mean, Terry Pratchett like put it well. You know, are are we fallen angels or are we ascendant apes? Mm -hmm. And if we're ascendant apes, then the only way is up. Yeah. Um, I like John Gray's uh, Straw Dogs. I think he's, he's oh, a, an atheist I quite like. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a sort of natural pessimist. So yeah, he's a bit even, of a downer. Even the atheism I still like reading. It tends to be I quite like the pessimism of someone like John Gray. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just a comment I'll just add into the conversation from Chris again. So uh, he says, I can't read too much into Matt's head, but as a former atheist, I defended a similar view to Matt's because I knew it was logically consistent rather than because it was what I actually believed. So uh, I, I think I can see that. Um, that's kind of what I meant earlier when I said the atheist viewpoint and made it categorically the atheist when it's obviously you've got different atheists that think differently. Mm. But 
I've, I've always although within the debate with Matt Dillahunty, I kept on I, I mentioned John Gray and he's got seven types of atheism. And then mm. like in the next mm. sentence, Matt Dillahunty was like, "Well, no, but there's really only just atheism." Here's yeah. one. Here's one. <laughs> Laxism. Is it? All that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm an aphilatelist because I don't <laughs> collect stamps. All of that. You, um, Phil, you mentioned that that Glenn had done some videos um, regarding abortion. It seems to be something you've. Um, you think you know, you've thought about and uh from a christian sort of perspective what what made you start exploring that that's like that's sort of like mm. dominic cummings on steroids uh, in terms of the <laughs> cult, cult, culturally so um um like, could, could, for me I, I i love having i i find it seems weird i found most of the the some really fruitful gospel discussions i've had often start from abortion because um, the connection is between, um, you know, valuing, um, you know, human life at all stages of development. Um, it, yeah. It's just deeply rooted in, in Christian anthropology and theology. And, uh, you know, Christians have been, a lot of Christians seem unaware that, like, it's probably, like, one of the first moral issues that, that Christians from the first century were against, you know, yeah. you, 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 yeah. universally. Um, yeah, exposure you know, even, of if, infants. Yeah. Even the cults, you know, you've got um, the Didac um, and the Epistle of, Barnab of Barnabas that are both probably late, late first century, early second century documents condemn abortion from from the outset. Um, yeah, as does the Hippocratic Oath. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's just. <laughs> To take it back to the Matt Dillahunty thing, I mean, he he always wants to get things back to slavery, um, and wants to be on the side of the good guys. But the the slavery battle was won by Christians back in the nineteenth century, and then he wants to come along later and and say, um, you know, accuse the Bible of injustice because he's now on the right side, and it's you know, and it's a little bit like. Um, you know, a, a soldier landing at Omaha Beach and, you know, wading through the water with his rifle. He runs up the beach shouting, I hate Nazis, I hate Nazis, and the year is 2020. Um, like, well done for being anti-slavery. Um, but you, it, do, it does not cost you anything to be anti-slavery today. The, 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 the battle was fought and it was fought by objectivists. It could not have been won by consequentialists like yourself. It literally could not have been won by them. It was won only by people who you know, have an entirely different moral framework who happen to be Christians. Um, and now, rather than running up Omaha Beach saying, I hate Nazis, ra rather than saying, I'm against slavery in the year 2020, um, the battle has moved on to other fronts where the humanity of all is under threat. And where is that under threat? Well, 125,000 human lives have been violently ended today. 125,000, you know, that, that means, you know, the number of people we've lost to coronavirus, um, we lost that many people to, to, to abortion by January 3rd, right? <laughs> the number of people we've lost this year to coronavirus, we lost that many people to abortion by January 3rd. Um, the, there, is, there is a genocide happening right now against the very weakest in society. And you know, the, the two reasons theologically I'm pro-life is Christmas and Easter. You know, Christmas, Christ assumed our humanity when? We're told, Luke chapter 1, you know, what is conceived in you is from the Holy Spirit. So from conception, Christ joined himself to our humanity. Um, when does life begin? Like, you, you're actually creedally unorthodox to be anything other than <laughs> pro-life. Life begins at conception. That is when Christ joined the human race from conception. Um, so because of Christmas and because of Easter, because I have a theology of the cross that says God honors the weak and despised things and the things that are not in order to nullify the things that are. And God is not this supercharged, um, clever, powerful Zeus figure in the heavens he is the God of the cross who is exalted in, in weakness and what looks like folly and, and what, could, what could look weaker and more foolish than the embryo.
mm. and caring, caring for the most marginalized member of our of our society. So theologically, that's where I'm coming from. And and you know, I, I think probably culturally, it was the um, uh, um, a world without downs by um, Sally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I remember. Yeah, uh, Sally Sally Phillips. Yeah. Um, so on, on that BBC documentary, 2017. Um, and just, yeah, we're eliminating a people group. We don't, we don't have to, we don't have to imagine, imagine there's a Hitler figure mm -hmm. who's trying to get rid of the disabled. Oh, yeah. we're doing it. We're mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's no one in Iceland under the age of five with Down syndrome. Oh, have we found a cure for Down syndrome? No, 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 <laughs> no, we've just killed them all. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, mm. that really got me thinking in 2017. We, we did, he came down with one of our Christmas videos, which was a that Down was syndrome. Fantastic. That, yeah, that was I excellent. think that was the best thing we've done. Yeah, um, I, cry I, every I can't time watch it. it. Yeah, same. Yeah. yeah, it's huge. Yeah, yeah, and 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 just you know recasting because you know the nativity is a little microcosmos, a little world in which you've got angels and animals, and you've got kings and shepherds. You know, the top and the bottom of heaven and earth of all society, and they all orbit around the sun, and Maybe. and everyone in that nativity has Down syndrome. And, uh, and I remember, I remember um, like pitching the idea to some friends and, and like some of the friends were, were kind of like, oh, Jesus has Down syndrome. Are you, are you sure Jesus should have Down syndrome? I'm not sure. Ooh. Mm -hmm. and, and that really disturbed me because I'm kind of like, well, in this world, everyone's got Down syndrome. If Jesus doesn't have Down syndrome, what kind of savior is he? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? Um, he you know, the unassumed is the unhealed. Um, yeah, and you know, he he assumed our entire humanity. I think he can take an extra chromosome in his stripe. Um, and and so yeah, just seeing Jesus with Down syndrome in in a world full of Downs, um, I think that's a a beautiful Christian vision. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. totally against the culture of death that we have in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have, have you had much pushback from from Christians about um, you know talking about abortion? sure sure um yeah and it, and it makes us um difficult for funders and you know because they they just want people who um will play it a lot safer and and, and stick to the gospel so you, you you have that argument that you know let's just be gospel people and yeah. and this is not a gospel issue uh, i'm never quite sure on what the taxonomy is and who gets to say um mm -hmm. on, on all those things um, and so, yeah, it's, it's so, yeah, Christians say don't engage it. And, and certainly from a pastoral point of view, it's very important whenever you preach on abortion to, to know that several of the people hearing you have had mm -hmm. abortions or who have, have caused their partners to have abortions. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's always vital to think of it pastorally, but, but in order to be pastoral, you need to name this thing Amen. that has happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm yeah that, that, that is it i've, I've had that in mm. pushback and that's that that sensitivity to people who do a great work in counseling in crisis pregnancy centers and the crisis uh, christian charities that are hypersensitive to the let's put pictures out in front of abortion centers mm. and and mm -hmm. that sort of thing and that there's that side of uh christian response to abortion and you got the let's not say it at all from the front, and there's got to be a tension. There's mm. got to be a tension, and I think yes, we mm. we have to name stuff just as we name slavery is wrong. We mm. name taking the life of anyone mm. in that way is is wrong, and we've, yeah. we've got to do that, but do it in a way that's sensitive. And is things like even even divorce. There's people in our churches mm. that are divorced, but mm. it's not the ideal. And we have to tread carefully and sensitively like we do with that topic because we are all sinners. Yeah. But there's still, this is wrong. And we as the church should be fighting that beast in our society. Mm. Uh, mm. That's what we're called to do as a church. And we're called to love those who have fallen under the beast's curse, mm. but we are called to fight the beast nonetheless. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's a huge thing that we need to find the balance on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's an evangelistic positive. I mean, if, if you think evangelism is about trying to 
gain the most amount of consent from the most number of people. So that, you know, the most number of people are, are you know most warm towards you. Then okay, um, mm-hmm. don't raise abortion, abortion, but mm-hmm. probably don't be an evangelist either. Um, probably and don't expect to grow your church. <laughs> don't expect to grow your church, and and don't expect to grow anything mm. really. Like that kind of vanilla, um, you know, always full of grace, seasoned with salt. That's meant to be bite there, and that's actually how people tick. They don't, you know, I, I, I quoted from Tom Holland uh, yesterday again on Twitter. I, I, I got to interview him last, last year and he had this brilliant comment on, I, I'm just sick of bishops just peddling the same kind of soft left liberal nonsense. If I want that, I'll ask a, a, a liberal Democrat counselor. I don't want to hear about Brexit. I know what you think about Brexit and it's not particularly interesting. Mm. <laughs> mm. And, you know, and, and you can get that with, with, evangelism and and you know let's just talk about love and love's lovely um but like if if you happen to believe that that there is sin and judgment let's say and god is angry with the world why would god be angry with the world Mm. like why is it just and and when we convict the world with regards to sin and righteousness and judgment is it just sin in this platonic sense this ethereal or is it grounded you know really we're really that bad that god is furiously angry with the really mm. why we're quite nice aren't we and you're, and you're like well we did kill another 800 babies in this country today mm. i don't know does yeah. that make you mad mm. and if it does it's not about me uh, it, i'm not part of that and that's that's the disco in the western realm yeah. at all at least we don't we don't see society as the beast in the same way the society is made up of individuals and my individual responsibility says i'm a good person right so how how dare you say i'm responsible for killing babies is generally yeah how how do we deal with that as the church when our society is so fragmented to well that kind of yeah that kind of atomism is, is exactly the problem that leads to abortion because what we've done is completely torn apart ourselves from one another so we 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 tear we tear sex from marriage and we tear sex from pregnancy and then we tear pregnancy from children mm-hmm. yeah and we entirely and and so in order to in in order to take the forceps to the unborn like we've got to actually take the forceps to the, the whole of society and say ah, it's, it's it's not my problem and it's, it's just the woman's choice um and actually and it's not it's the woman it's not the mother's choice she's no longer a mother she's a woman mm. who has you know the product of conception within her and so we've entirely atomized things where, whereas you know any any society that has a future needs to be about children <laughs> and therefore it needs to be about families and therefore it needs to put back together the things that our society has, has desperately tried to cut apart we've tried to cut apart sex from marriage and sex from pregnancy and pregnancy from children children from families and if we're going to have a, a civilization at all <laughs> Ah, come home to Jesus. You know, here in the church, what do you have? You, you, you actually have sex in marriage with children and families, and it's woven together in a covenant of love. Mm. That, that's, that's a holistic vision for life. Where it's will, broken, it's yeah. crafted in. And it, I, I think the, it's one of the biggest things I've learned in the last two years of working with international students is that part of my gospel message that's been missing is the family of God. Mm. And, and yeah. that's the bit that's missing in the Western church hugely is this, yeah. the, the church is a huge apologetic for the Christian faith Yeah, that yes, you may have had an abortion, but you're welcome here, yeah. but we still, we think it's wrong that that's mm-hmm. going on in society that you've succumbed to it. Yeah. 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 But yeah. we love you and you're welcome here. You, Oh, you've had a, di- a divorce. Find your family here with us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, come home <laughs> like that that's, yeah yeah that's a huge thing that's missing and uh yeah definitely needs to be heard more and something i'm trying to bring into to the gospel messages when i have the opportunity yeah and if you don't have that kind of church family you can't be pro-life either because um in mm. order to be pro-life you need to embrace the single mum. you need to embrace that young girl who's just gotten pregnant and say brilliant that's okay we can we can we can do this together you know mm. don't go to the clinic and get that problem sorted out because yeah. that's that's not a problem that gets sorted out that way yeah um let's let's embrace you and and let's and therefore the church needs to have the church needs to not simply be traditional conservatives on the subject of the family 
Mm-hmm. You, can't, you can't actually be pro-life and that. Because if you just believe in the nuclear family, you're not going to be pro-life at all. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to believe in, the, in pro-life, then you've got to embrace life and all its messiness. And the family is going to have to have a much broader definition. You know, we, we, we celebrated yesterday, the one year since we adopted JJ. Um, and, you know, I've, I've just been telling people, you know, constantly, I do not believe in traditional family values. I'm against that. Right? <laughs> um, the, and, and Christians are not really into the traditional family at all. You know, the Roman society thought that, that Christians were, were radicals and subversive um, for, you know, for this idea of, you know, let's go and save those infants who are being exposed and let's mm. look after the orphan and the widow and let's have this, let's call each other brother and sister across racial lines and across, you know, mm. um, slave and free and, and all that kind of stuff and have this radically rough and ready kind of vision of family. Um, so, yeah, I, re- I think a real challenge is traditionally the pro-life team has been traditional conservative um, but that is unsustainable. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, we need to we need to be um, very radical and non traditional in our forms of family, actually, in order to prize life at, at every stage. But yeah, mm. no, that's, that's 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 helpful. That's helpful. Mm. But it's um, no, it's good. It's it's um, it's good to see someone like yourself to having that discussion um, because it's just it's so infrequent. And I, I often while having a discussion with a friend this week, I'm, I'm not an Anglican, uh, but... Um, Are you Anglicurious? Anglican, Anglicurious. <laughs> yeah, I'm... We're friendly I'm, to Anglicans. <laughs> I'm really... I'm, 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 I'm a wannabe Jesuit. I love the Jesuits. Okay. But, yeah, but yeah. I am, you know, I, I sort of class myself as an evangelical, but I do. I, do. I, have, I have a sort of fascination, unhealthy fascination with the Jesuits. I just really like the Jesuits. <laughs> non-denominational uh, denomination yeah, with a, yeah. a, a trend towards tradition <laughs> yeah and I, I found as i get older like um i have a growing sort of desire for tr- tradition like the sort of um the pomp the pomp of sort of um of of tradi- traditional sort of christianity and um and i i speak to a lot of people sort of my age sort of mid-30s you know maybe you know, converted as a teenager in their twenties, you know, and before that it was all, you know, warehouse, you know, no cross on the wall, you know, sing, you know, loud singing and uh, lots of young people. And I've, I just, uh, I've just increasingly sort of uncomfortable with, uh, with that. So I think that's probably why I, you know, I like listening to, uh, um, oh, I can't remember the name of, um, what's the, I can't remember. The, the Vicar name. of Dibley. No, no, no. no I'll no. be on this one, Dan. What's the what's the music? Gregorian song. Gregorian chanting. Oh, really? Really? Wow. Yeah, I love. Mate, this is new. I'm, I'm learning this too. Wow. Honestly, I love a bit of Gregorian chanting. Oh, yeah. Man. So if I'm working, Gregorian chanting, love it. Gosh. gosh. Few candles yeah. on. So hop, skip, and a know? jump. You're across the Tiber in no time, yeah. Daniel. I know. I know. Be, be careful, man. I've been re- I've just finished <laughs> reading a. Uh, a biography of Luther, though, so I think he's, um, okay. which I very much cool. enjoyed. Careful there as well. Well, yeah, he's pretty high church too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. well, um, what would be interesting is um, sort of a couple of questions. What, who, who are a few Christian thinkers or that? Well, all right, not thinkers. There's a few few Christians who we should know about, but we don't. Oh, I don't. I don't oh, gosh, I don't know who people don't know. Um, hmm. um, who I've benefited from, and we've we've already said um, Tim Keller. In in this country, I um, uh, my favourite three preachers are Mike Reeves, who you, you might know, um, author of The Good God and Christ Our Life, and um, and all sorts. So um, he's also the the principal of uh, Union. Uh, School of Theology. Um, Paul Blackham, um, who uh, presents book by book, which they're just amazing commentaries, actually. Um, they must have done about 30 books of the Bible um, as, as video discussions with Richard Buse hosting Paul Blackham and somebody else is the guest. But their commentaries are insanely good. I first got to know Paul back in uh, All Souls uh, 20 years ago. 
Um, phenomenal, phenomenal preacher. Um, Steve Levy, uh, phenomenal preacher in um, Swansea in, in Wales. So Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Swansea. He's a shouty Lloyd-Jones. Um, <laughs> and he preaches. And as, as you, you know, listen in, I mean, I, I, I mainly... You know, listen, listen to his sermons online, um, and you can imagine him you know, like preaching to the drunk at the back, um, hmm. a raw gospel. You know, if, if Luther preaches law and gospel, uh, Steve Levy preaches a raw gospel about our, our desperate need. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat as that drunk at the back, hmm. um, and, and we need Christ. And then he offers Christ in a, in a, beautiful, um, in a beautiful way. So... Hmm. Yeah, those those are some good in terms of thinkers. I don't know. No, that's no, that's fine. No, I haven't heard those two, so it's always nice to okay. write, write them down well, and have a little search. I don't know if it's through you or something in the apologetics group, but I've heard of Paul Blackham and I get occasional videos from him. I think on my mm. Facebook feed, I might, I might pay a bit more attention now. That's a good mm. re- recommendation. Well, I'm, well, I'm gonna have to okay. start um closing up dan it's uh, okay just, uh, one more quick go, one, go, got one go more. for the question go on what what um what books though what sort of three i don't know three three or four books mm. um, you've got to have we well, have to have this question at the end of every yeah video yeah. so yeah it has to be done <laughs> well i love books so i'm always looking for recommendations but what sort of what, what sort of books people listening do you think people would you know christians right now would sort of benefit from reading it doesn't have to be christian books actually but but books that we could we could all benefit from uh, I would say The Good God by Mike Reeves in terms of your doctrine of God. Um, I think that's vital. Uh, Luther's commentary on Galatians. That would be pretty, pretty awesome um, if you had that kind of. Also, his um, brief exhortation in what to look for and expect in the Gospels. It's, um, it's literally like a page and a half, but you can say, oh, I've read a Luther book. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Is there a place for tracts? <laughs> Luther was Luther was totally into tracts. Um, uh, the mystery of Christ by John Bear um, is okay, really heard of that. fascinating. So he, he's an Orthodox theologian. Um, his way to Nicaea about um, pre-Nicene, uh, anti-Nicene um, theologians. Um, is brilliant. So his, his stuff on the early church is, is a great introduction. Um, I think, and, and I think people, yeah, being well-versed in, if you want to be an apologist, then go to Justin Martyr, go to Irenaeus. Mm. Um, yeah, those, those guys were, were, were classics. So yeah, study, study those guys. Mm. That's that really That's- interesting. Just as a sort of point on that. I'm only really just starting to engage with the early church fathers. Mm. I've been a Christian my whole life. How have mm. I not either been taught? Like, how is there never a course on early church fathers or is this Christian the, history began in, in 1517, you know? Yeah. From, yeah. From the book of <laughs> Acts the, to even, the door of Wittenberg. <laughs> even the reformation, like I, I only know bits and bobs that I picked up and generally mm. they're the negatives. But the, mm. it is something I think, that like Dan talking about his fascination with Jesuits is when you've become a Christian, you start to realize why has Christianity been around for 2000 years? Generally in your teenagers, if you've grown, grown up in it is I've got to get beyond the platitudes of Jesus loves, loves me. This I know that's true, but there's something more potent and almost mysterious, but beautiful deeper in that. And Ha, like st- suddenly I'm in the church history going, this is beautiful. <laughs> These guys have yes. seen it for this long. Yes. Yes. It's not scripture, but they're, they're dwelling on scripture and you can learn so much. And so it's the one yeah. thing that is really annoying about being a Protestant in a non-denominational church is we right. just miss that. Right. Um, right. Um, yeah, heritage. Yeah. 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 I love that cartoon about, um, you know, it's, it's some teacher who's got a wall chart about the history of, of, of the church and it kind of, it, it sort of starts and then there's a split in the 11th century and then there's a split of the Protestant Reformation and then it sort of splits in, into all these different kind of tributaries and then he points to this one tiny little spot on the map and he circles it and he says, and this is where we got our theology right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it, well, it we, have, we have got it right, obviously, with no confirmation bias. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is true. About My the pastor church. told me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I second the church father stuff. Is um, mm. there's there's some great stuff in there. Like we've been doing, like been running like a Zoom group, uh, sort of once a week, going through Ignatius's seven epistles. Mm. It's been really interesting going going through that, and he's, he's a bit obsessed with bishops and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. but the rest of the stuff is is so interesting. Yeah. Um, well, well worth getting into. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And Just Mike Rees has got a great time. series on that. Yeah, I'm going to call time. I, I would, Good man. I've got another. I, I have. I would love to, but I'm. <laughs> I'm getting spaced out, and it doesn't get pretty on the camera. <laughs> 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 if I start drooling, wake me up. But the, yeah. um, it's been such a pleasure talking to you, Glenn. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Yeah. No worries. We no worries. That. Well, Joe Joe Rogan is leaving um, YouTube. I know. He's is going he? to Spotify. So who's going to step into the well, void? There you go. Long form podcasting yeah, here win. with Critical Witness. You've. <laughs> it's a it's a real niche. It's a real niche. <laughs> I think that is. I don't know. I think we've hit enough <laughs> topics. I think we're doing okay. It's not too niche. It's just you've got to at least hang on for another ten seconds because we, we we've got to hit two hours. Right? Oh, we've got to hit two hours. Yeah. 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 My, my, my timer says two hours. Maybe. Oh, maybe. Okay. Like good. 10. Good. Oh, we're done. Two. See ya. Yes. <laughs> Bye, Glenn. That was the ten minutes that um, we started off with, and you you blocked this. Stream yeah, that's true. It was all my fault because it was your fault. I just have to go back to that point. The start of this stream <laughs> failed because Glenn asked to record it. I can just yeah. send you the YouTube file. And uh, you can then, if if you enjoyed it that much, you can put it on your podcast. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. We've set a precedent now for two hours. So (laughs) (laughs) you won't get any more guests. (laughs) Two hours fortnightly. (laughs) Cheers again. We'll we'll wrap this up. Thanks, Bill. I'll I'll put it in the stream. Thanks for watching on the stream. We've had apparently 12 viewers. Uh, Thank you, Afi and Chris, for commenting. Uh, It's been a pleasure reading a few of your comments on there. And uh, thank you again, Glenn, for your time. Maybe when we find some other cultural messiness, we can have you on again too. <laughs> Throw me the hospital pass. Oh. Yeah. Well, at this rate, we'll have plenty to talk about maybe next week. <laughs> yeah, true, true. All right. I'm up for it. Cool. Thanks, guys. God bless. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah, Caleb?